menge yini yo maka ya kona hasti wale saku mabunu hi wona ya shomsaka zgebeng remember as we were talking here an army tank came by you know very well that we are at war then what do you say about the people who are supporting the MNR, who are arming them so that they can come and kill us? We know that it is the South Africans who are doing this, and you remember very well what happened in Matola and in Liberdad, outside Maputo. What do you say about this? I remember very well when these planes from South Africa bombed in Liberdad. We actually thought at first it was American planes. Now we feel very sad when we think of all the brothers and sisters a few kilometers away, who can't stay in peace, who are always thinking of running away and taking cover. If nobody was attacking us, we would be able to use all that money which is being used to buy weapons, to buy food, to buy medicine, and to buy building materials. We would be able to buy bread, to buy plates. But because of this war, the government instead is using this money to buy more weapons to fight the MNR. All of these things, you know, it led to, from there, I had no one really to supervise, but I did have the responsibility of putting the, the, uh, arri the offices together for the arrival of the first Trident submarine and also assisting in putting the offices together for the command post at Bangor. And during that time was when the first strike philosophy became very evident to me that uh, the American people are not being fed the truth. There is a, a first strike philosophy coming out of the Pentagon and it was very evident in the in the command post, it was very evident in various meetings that I sat in on that, uh, you know, like Jerry said earlier, we're not out to shoot missiles at empty silos. We're out to to protect our peace through strength, as, as the present administration puts it, at, at any cost. And finally it came to a point where I could no longer go along with this. And after two years of putting these offices together and, and soul-searching myself, I resigned my position at Bangor the day that the first nuclear submarine arrived in at Naval Sub Base Bangor. It was when I resigned, the, my supervisor, my immediate supervisor commended me. He said uh, something to the effect that he wished he could do the same thing, that he, he could have that commitment in him because he had very serious conflicts himself. But he only had a few years left to go before he retired, and he couldn't throw his retirement down the drain. He didn't approve my resignation. I had to go to his supervisor, who was a captain, and the captain would not accept my resignation. He put it in terms that I'm burning bridges behind me, but I knew good and well why he wouldn't accept it, because my resignation, my resignation was threatening to his position. It addressed the fact that thousands of Seattle area families could be fed on just the crumbs from Bangor alone. And he, being a supply officer, found that very threatening. But uh, 
It's not things that he said, it's just nonverbals that came out in the discussion. And so I rewrote my resignation. I wanted to leave the place, and I wanted to be honest, so I just rewrote it in briefer statements and, and uh, resigned. In doing so, I broke a trust level with Jerry because I said that I would never resign without it being a joint decision. And the day that the Trident arrived, she was not there. She was taking Troy to a, a camp in, in Leavenworth, Washington. And uh, when she came back a day later, she arrived to all my office pictures in the, in the bedroom. Everything that was on my desk was relocated into my bedroom. And it was quite a shock for Jerry and quite a period of adjustment. That's when we found out the non-conditional love and acceptance of our neighbors because it was really overwhelming as to the fact that they may not have agreed, you know, with where we were coming from. And they themselves were working for military installations uh, or in the service, but they could still accept us as friends. And that just really blew me away. That That shattered a lot of my reasons for not resigning because I thought we'd be alienated and I thought the kids would be alienated at school and so forth and and we received the opposite. How many of those rejected you, of those 180 applications? All of them. Based on, on one, you know, reason or another. I think those were only the ones that he kept. I, there were a lot that he applied for that he never kept copies of or never heard back from either. A lot of doors that I walked into, a lot of offices where I went in and talked to people that, that there was no record of. Mm. These were actual applications that I filled out or cover letters with resumes that, I, that Jerry and I kept copies of that I received negative replies from. Now, Al, let's, let's be quite clear about this. How many of this approximate, approximately 180 jobs you applied for, how many of those were civilian jobs as opposed to, to, to d defense contract or defense jobs? How many every, every one of them. I wouldn't apply at a defense contract or a defense-related employment. You, you had made a specific decision about that. That's right. So 180 civilian jobs, civilian employees, civilian employers rejected you for work in that 16-month period. That's right. That I had documented, you know, there was more than that that, that were not documented. At the time of the A bombing, there were about 100,000 Koreans in Hiroshima Prefecture, and 53,000 were living in the city, of whom 48,000 were among the A-bomb victims. As many as 30,000 of these Koreans were estimated to have been killed. It is worth mentioning that even in this situation, the Korean victims were treated with prejudice. Let me take Mr. O's case, for example. He was seriously burnt within 1.5 kilometers of the hypercenter. He went into the river and then reached one of the emergency stations. When his turn came, the army officer, who was apparently substituting for the doctor, stared at him and said, Are you a Korean? Mr. O said, Yes, I am. And the officer said, Shut up, you Korean. この広島市の現在川内というところに住んでいますけれども、え、もう70過ぎてる人です。で、この人がこの原爆ドームから測って1.2キロのところで原爆にあったんです。もちろん1.2キロですから、もう全身爆裂攻撃になりましたんですね。で、火傷を負って。で、彼は熱いもんですから、この川の中に飛び込んで、いくつか川を渡って、あるその、陸軍の軍事、この救護所、
小学校ですね小学校の運動場にテントを張って臨時救護所があったんですけどもそこにたどり着いたんですでそこに行ったら自分より先に2人か3人先着の人がいてで自分の順番が来たから「あの先生助けてください」とこうして手を合わせてお願いしたんですねそしたら当時はもうお医者が少なかったもんですからお医者さんが陸軍の軍人なんですね軍刀を下げてで軍棒をかぶったでその軍人がそのこうして頼んでる王さんの言葉と顔をじっとこう睨みつけていたらどうも日本人じゃないんですねそれで「貴様先人か」ってこう尋ねたんですねで王さんが「はい私は朝鮮人ですと」というふうに答えたらその軍人が何と言ったかというと「貴様先人のくせしてギャギャ抜かすな」とこういうふうに怒鳴りつけながら結局治療一つ施してもらえずに王さんはそこからかろうじてまたこの川を渡って自分の家にたどり着きそして戦後長い歴史の中でキュウリあの食べるキュウリを切ったらあのこう寝ちゃっこい汁が出ますけどもそういうのを体に塗りつけたりじゃがいもバレーションを体にこう塗りつけてそして結局まあ治していったでこの差別というのは大変なあの言葉では表現できないそういうその恐るべきですね差別が、えー、あったわけですねでしかも、えーヒロ。はい。
Omene te to mai te e aita to ona hapi i ane te reo mahui to le hapi a. This boy wants to learn Polynesian because he is a Polynesian, and he doesn't want to be called a European or a Frenchman. Ayona, are you being taught Polynesian at school? Yes. We have four hours. We have four hours. We have four gaining the, uh, the deterrent capability that we need in our strategic systems. But at the same time, the President has uh, what I believe is a very uh, noble concept, and that is to try to develop a means of protecting people instead of avenging them, and try to develop a system that will be a thoroughly reliable uh, uh, defense against incoming Soviet missiles. It's a very big, difficult job. We have money in the budget to start on the, uh, on the uh, uh, research on it, and uh, it is vital, I think, that we proceed that way. If we can achieve it, and I hope and believe we can, then we would have uh, a method of uh, rendering impotent uh, these missiles and removing this nuclear shadow that uh, has uh, been around the world for a very long time. But more than that, Mr. Chairman, it is absolutely vital that we do it because the Soviets have been heavily engaged in this exact kind of work since at least 1967. And uh, if they should develop this capability, and we did not have it, uh, I think it would be self-evident what kind of a world that would be. If, if, if we knew that our missiles no longer had any deterrent uh, capability whatever, and the Soviets had the ability to, uh, to defend against them uh, completely and effectively, and that's exactly what they're working on, then I think we can readily imagine uh, that uh, we would have to uh, give in to practically every demand that we're made on.
But what we have to recognize, I think, is that if we need a capable, credible, effective deterrent, we have to be able to respond to Soviet threat. And if we are able to respond only to an attack in one theater, it is absolutely certain, in my mind, that the Soviets will uh, will make an attack in two theaters, which they're perfectly capable of doing. What is what is the long wrong, long range definition now? What do you define? Well, I, I would still hope that although there was a setback, as you pointed out last year, that if we can have the kinds of uh, authorizations that we've requested this year and that we've indicated that would be required next year, that we can then level out and that by the end of this decade we will be in a position to deter attack. I, I, I would not want any misunderstanding, sir. I wouldn't want it, you to feel that this is uh, with a kind of, of capability that we're trying to get that would enable us to launch attacks all over the world. It's a kind of capability to respond to in a credible way and thus to deter a clear Soviet ability to attack in more than one theater at a time. I would hope by the end of the decade we would be at that point. Upon finally arriving at the Civil Defense Reception Center at the school in Froster, Christian, Ron Vague, and the family would find themselves barely 25 kilometers from the nuclear target of Venice Airport. It is our deepest conviction that a nuclear war cannot be won and must never be fought. We must not rest in our search for a safer world dedicated to eliminating nuclear weapons with technology providing ever greater safety, not ever greater fear. The possibility of developing and sharing with you technology that could provide a security shield and someday eliminate the threat of nuclear attack. It is for us the most hopeful possibility of the nuclear age and we very much appreciate Canada's support on SDI research. We must never doubt the great good that Canada and the United States can accomplish together. Never doubt for a moment our journey toward a world where someday all may live under freedom's star, free to worship as they please, to speak their thoughts, to come and go as they will, to achieve the fullness of their potential, and yes, reach out to comfort those who have fallen with the godly gift of human love. This is the idealist within us whose heart is pure and can power our journey with faith and courage. But the realist must be there, too. Our navigator at the helm whose eagle eyes discern each movement of the sky above and waves below. We must never stop trying to reach a better world, but we'll never make it if we don't see our world as it truly is. We cannot look the other way when treaties are violated, human beings persecuted, religions banned, and entire democracies crushed. How much is the economic relationship between Mexico and the United States discussed in this country? I mean, how much do Americans really understand about the devastating economic stranglehold that the United States has on Mexico? I don't think Americans, most Americans don't understand. I know some do. I think that a lot of us look at Mexicans as foreign intruders and that immigrants as people who don't have the same rights that we do. And I, I think that we don't have the right to, to say that or to use those people in ways that we do in terms of labor. And to, we just don't have the right to spend the money on arms and make other people, these Mexicans and other people in other countries, suffer from that because they don't have enough food. We could, be, we could be buying their food or helping them learn how to make food or 
how to, you know, if we could be helping them instead of hurting them, but we're not doing it. And I think that uh, we don't, um, we don't, we separate that again. I think we just separate that from ourselves in terms of that isn't our responsibility. I think it is our responsibility. I don't think that anybody has a right to use somebody else for their own benefit in terms of human suffering and in terms of hunger and terms of labor, like using him as a slave or to think that somebody else is not equal to you because their skin color is different or because they come from a different state or a different country and to think that they don't they don't relate to you, that you're not responsible for them. I think we're responsible for everybody and especially now the way that the arms race is all over the world and the monies are all over the world that we are responsible for everybody. We have to, we each have to accept that, especially as Americans, because we have the resources to take care of it. We have the resources to pay for it. But we're not using them. I just, you know, I wish that we, I wish that we were. I would like to do something to help that come about. What do you think? Yeah. Are you I, ready? <coughs> I, uh, I think most people don't realize how much the United States does take advantage of uh, not only Mexico but other Latin American countries. Um, I I never lived in Mexico, but I've been to uh, other Latin American countries, and uh, I've seen how uh, <clears throat> American companies um, have gone in there, set up their business, and uh, produced and manufacture things and. Uh, refine oil and so on like that at very cheap cost to them and then they uh, can sell it at a higher price and uh, the people who live in the country don't get any benefit from it they just uh, they just they have a job but they don't get paid very high wages I mean I mean it's something they do get a job but uh, for the most part it's just the American companies that gain all the benefits from it and uh, I don't think a lot of people in the U.S. really realize that, what's going on. Uh, but, uh, Tara, at your school, how much, uh, how much discussion is there, is there about the Mexican people, Mexican culture, Mexican... Uh, uh, Do we talk about that at school, Tara? Well, they talk about how people in Mexico don't have a lot of food and they come to the States to get work, but they don't really talk about it as, as us using them, using them for work that we would usually do. They don't talk about it in that way. They talk about it, though. What do you, Tara? What 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 do you feel when you when you see this tape? What what do you feel about what um, Mrs. Ortega is saying and, and her neighbors are saying? Well, even though you can't really understand them, you can you can understand in your own way that what they are saying, and I feel that. They have as much right as anybody to have food and to tell people that they that they need that and to express their feelings to other people. I kind of think what has happened in our in our culture is we've we were talking about this American dream syndrome yesterday, I think, and that American dream to me is something that we have all really kind of bought and we have thought that uh, no matter what we do we can have a good life if we work hard enough and if we <laughs> believe in ourselves but mostly if we work hard enough but you see when you look at people like this and you see everybody works hard enough I mean everybody has to work very hard for whatever they earn but it doesn't come out that way and it just is it's almost like we've been sold that and we bought it and we believe it for ourselves and we think it's the same way for other people and it's not it's just uh, an American fallacy, really. It, and that is probably part of the reason that Americans don't look at 
the world in terms of, I know that, you know, everybody has a consciousness, but I don't think all of us look at the world in terms of equality as much as we do in terms of, in our own country, you know, our rights and what we <coughs> need, our equality with our fellow Americans in terms of our, um, our own self-interest, in terms of, I guess, the way our culture has come to believe that, you know, you're the first person you should think of, you should make sure there's, you know, there's women's rights, there's gay rights, there's all kinds of rights here in America, and we're fighting for all these little causes, and they're all for ourselves. I don't, I just can't understand, you know, why we can see all these rights for ourselves and not see the rights for the people that are consequently suffering from our own selfishness. Yeah, I think it's terrible that I've I've heard a lot of people complaining about uh, these poor Mexican people that come to America to work during the harvest time, and uh, I've heard a lot of uh, people complaining that they're taking jobs away from Americans and so on like that. But these people are surviving. You know, they're trying to survive. Um, they just work for bare minimum wage. I don't think there's any American family that would go to work for that type of salary and live under those conditions and do that kind of work, even if the Mexican people didn't come up here. Mm. I don't think the work would get done. Being here in the Northwest, we have an agricultural base and uh, we, ha we are faced with a, a problem of, of this type here. A lot of uh, Mexican people come here during the summer and fall to pick fruit and the harvest and the the thing that the media brings out around here is that uh, there there are taking away jobs that other people could have here mm. and that's basically what their complaint is they don't show mm. any sympathy toward the Mexican people that mm. they have to go through any suffering and you know if they didn't have this job they wouldn't have anything and they never bring that point out. Our chief political correspondent, David Halton, is still in Quebec City tonight. He joins us from there. David, uh, in the days ahead, a lot of things are going to be said about this summit, and I think one of them will be uh, in terms of its orchestration, that it may well have been the most orchestrated summit anyone's ever seen. Well, Peter, it was certainly the most stage-managed summit that I've ever seen. Uh, everything was done to underline what Mulroney calls the new era of cooperation between the U.S. and Canada, and everything was done to underline Mulroney's uh, uh, position front and center in that process. You know, not only was the Governor General not invited, but steps were taken by the Prime Minister's office to ensure that uh, the Canadian ministers here in no way upstaged Mulroney. There was a media request today for a photo opportunity of the separate meetings that Canadian ministers had with their American counterparts, and that request was refused. En rapport avec l'événement d'aujourd'hui, est-ce que vous pouvez nous en parler un peu? About this demonstration held today. Can you tell us what brings you here? La question de de l'emploi. Among other things, the question of full employment. I actually work, militate in Quebec City within a number of organizations that want, that are in favor of a full employment policy, which is new. For example, in which the workers' participation will be essential for the elaboration of this policy and its application. Et euh, politique de plein emploi de type nouveau qu'on pourrait aussi, euh, qu'on devrait relier à la question de la paix, bien sûr. A policy of full employment that would be a link to the peace question, of course. For example, a policy of full employment which will not be based on arms build-up and more police jobs. Est-ce que vous trouvez que euh, les nouvelles télévisées sont claires et précises? Do you find the newscasts clear and precise? I would say that they are quite clear and precise. The problem for me is more the choice of themes covered by the news media. Ce dont ils nous parlent, c'est assez facile à comprendre habituellement, mais ça ne correspond généralement pas à ce que j'aimerais qu'on entende. What they talk about is generally quite easy to understand but that doesn't correspond to what uh, I would like to hear. Do you find that they're more or less biased? Yes, yes, it is biased, because there are major issues like those of arms race, for example, or the disarmament and the peace movements, of which we actually hear very little. Have you got an opinion formulated on Mr. Reagan's visit to Canada? 
Despite everything, it can create a momentum and give a shot in the arm to the more progressive forces. And it should wake them up, stimulate them, this visit, to work together and to act. From the instructions to the media for Monday, 18th of March, 2.25 p.m., President and Prime Minister arrive at La Citadelle. 2.30 p.m., signing ceremony begins. This is Washington. Well, the thing is, this is their first summit. And it's on Canadian territory, but the Americans have come in and they just take over. And PMO's left behind. I can't guarantee it's going to be any better today, because, but with your balcony shot, it might be better. At least you're not fighting for a tripod position. Pool number seven cameras shoot cutaways during first five minutes of ceremony. Pool number seven takes holding position in South Terrace. 2.50 p.m. Prime Minister and President proceed to Terrace for photo opportunity through East Terrace door. Pool number seven goes to position on riser, south side of Terrace. Twelve from pool number five go to position on East Terrace. Speak inside, they deliver their statements. Go out there and walk over walk the camera. They want to remove the soldiers back because we got a camera. Now the wind died down, so it's all right. Everybody else is turning it down. Everybody needs to move over this way. <laughs> Mr. President, you've had success here. You think you'll have it with the MX? Uh, good job, Advance. Good job. I've seen things even on television showing the conditions in some of the local places here, but I've never heard the the part discussed about Mexican Mexico's capital coming up here and you know that's probably something nobody thought about I mean a lot of people haven't thought about in terms of you know where we get all our resources we have all, a lot of resources but where do we get some of the things that they have mm. what is it like oil or some of the resources yeah. that these countries have that we use up
against the Russians today. We're Sorry about it. Here. Faced with a foreign debt of 86 billion Australian dollars and to cut the budget deficit, the Australian Labour government recently announced that it would resume the sale of uranium to France, which it had banned in 1983 in protest against French nuclear testing in the Pacific. Citadel, the old fort built in the early 1800s to protect Quebec from possible American invasion, the two countries signed an agreement to modernize their joint air defense early warning line. One billion dollars. They've listened in New Zealand. Yeah. They've listened in New... I, I, I must admit, I never thought... I, I thought that, that when the New Zealanders, when, when the Prime Minister said, we're, we're not going to have any more uh, nuclear ships here, I really thought that that was, that was just crap. And then after a while it really sunk in that, that this guy had actually said, we, we're, not going to, we're not going to have any more warships here. <laughs> And the Americans ha had no choice. That they just can't yeah. send anyone else there. I mean, and a New Zealander is just, in terms of stra strategics, just as strategic as we are. I mean, if they can do it, and they're a lot smaller, and they've got a lousy economy, why can't we do it? The MX missile, a new American nuclear weapon system with... 10 350 kiloton warheads in each missile, which Ronald Reagan has personally called the peacekeeper, will cost the average American family approximately $400 in tax over the period of its development, say the next five to 10 years. And we're now going to show how much this one weapons system represents per American family in bags of groceries. Over the last month, I have kept track of our, of our grocery budget and I recorded $238.15 spent on 37 bags of groceries and that averages out to $6.44 a bag. And this is including the fact that I do couponing, which is um, couponing and double couponing, turning in cents off coupons on products that are nationally advertised in magazines and papers in order to save about 10% on the grocery bill. And so the cost per bag is a little bit low, but that's what I've been doing this last month. Well, if we, if we take uh, your costing uh, and we realize that this is a low costing and that an average American family will probably be spending more on their groceries, but taking your costing, that represents, for the one missile system, the MX, that represents a total cost to you of 62 bags of groceries, or approximately two months food supply. Well, what do you feel about uh, this? Had you ever thought of uh, putting... Uh, weapons, uh, the cost of weapons for the average American family into units of uh, grocery bags before? I, I had thought of it in terms of the fact that the poor people that, were, that are in the third world are suffering from the lack of funds that are going, not going there because we're putting it into weapons. Now how much, 
How many of us would be willing to give up this many groceries to help those people survive instead of paying for weapons? That's my question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I have a question for the Prime Minister. In the past, uh, the Prime Minister and many of his uh, colleagues have said that there will in no way whatsoever ever be an involvement by this country in the Star Wars or SDI program. Now, at the summit meeting in Quebec, in the joint communique, there was an announcement that we would now be engaged in new joint defense programs. And the President of the United States also put forward, I believe, in his luncheon address, the invitation for Canada to become involved in the development of a new technology. Mr. Speaker, I want to ask the Prime Minister, does this indicate that Canada is now negotiating with the United States for an involvement in the $25 billion R&D program that is now underway in the United States? Or will he give us assurances in this House that no Canadian firm or subsidiary of any foreign firm operating in Canada will in any way, shape or form be involved in anything doing with the research, development or manufacture dealing with Star Wars technology? Mr. Speaker, there is... Mr. Speaker, there uh, has been no such uh, request by the United States, no such invitation, there is no such negotiation. I should point out to the uh, Honourable Member that uh, for some time, during, including during a time when he was a Minister of the Crown, Canada has been involved in, uh, in space research with the United States. Uh, most Canadians, for example, were very proud of the uh, Canada Arm project. Most Canadians are very proud of Mark Garneau. Most Canadians would be alarmed by the suggestion of the member for Winnipeg Fort Garry that we should turn our back upon uh, any involvement with any kind of peaceful space investigation. I give the assurance to the honourable member that Canada will continue to respect and to be bound by our commitment to the ABM Treaty. Here, here. Supplementary question. I think you should say something, <laughs> Susan. I think the media could be very effective in, yeah. in affecting change in this country. To When 80% of the people approached for the peace petition wanted to sign right away, which asked for four different points, one of which was Canada to be a nuclear weapons-free zone, and the government is doing nothing about it. When Joe Clark went around the, the country interviewing hundreds of peace groups, and his report, which he has all now prepared, hasn't yet been released because Brian Maroney won't release it. We know that the Canadian people are supportive of the peace movement and yet we have no support from the media and I think if the media did at least listen to the peace movement and perhaps do some of their own research they would realize that what we're protesting is very valid and that one day maybe we could have a Canada could set an example in the world as a peacemaking nation. At the moment we're, we're losing face. And the, the important, uh, I presume that if the Honourable Member has, uh, has any interest other than mischief, if he has any interest other than mischief, uh, he would want to know that Canada intends to honour our obligations under the ABM Treaty. Not only do we intend to honour them, but we now have a document signed by the President of the United States and the Prime Minister of Canada, which reaffirm the intention of both Canada and the United States to respect the ABM Treaty insofar as SDI is concerned. Here, here, here. Remember for Winnipeg, Birds Hill. President Reagan is deeply involved in his own selling job tonight, trying to sell the MX missile to the Senate. He wants a billion and a half dollars to build 21 of the missiles, and he is closing in on success. This is an NBC survey of the Senate on the question. 47 senators likely to vote for the MX, 42 against, 11 undecided or unwilling to say. The MX, which carries 10 warheads, is a controversial weapon. The president has made it a key part of his nuclear defense plan. As John Dancy reports from Capitol Hill tonight, this vote is a major political test. Moscow meeting the MX is an emotional issue. Vice President Bush was heckled three times today as he spoke in Baltimore. When will we have enough nuclear weapons? He argued that the MX is crucial to the arms talks in Geneva. To vote down the MX at this critical juncture, would send the worst possible message, in my view, to, to Geneva.
Hello, uh, my name's Sam Smiley. And when Peter offered us the opportunity to speak to a Russian family, I was delighted. Because of all the people in the world, to us in the UK, the, the Russians are the big mystery. We want to see discussion. We want to open relations with the Russian people. We want to be friendly towards them and then to friendly towards us. We want to see discussion in schools and in the media. Uh, we want to see the abolition of nuclear arms, primarily. We're hoping that you will record a message, a tape for us. I'd like to conclude by uh, quoting a few lines from Robert Burns, where he said that, for all that and all that, it's coming yet for all that, that man to man the world over shall brothers be for all that. Thank you. Well, I'm David Smiley. Um, I'd like to know if in the schools in Russia there's much information given to the children about Britain and the Western world. I know that there's very little information given to us about Russia and way of life and things. Uh, in fact, it's hardly ever spoken about in the school at all. Also, the, the issue of the nuclear arms is rarely spoken about. I was wondering if it was the same in Russia. We videotaped a message from the Smiley family in Dumbarton, which we took the following month to the Kolosovs in Leningrad. And uh, like my husband and my son, I have no idea of the way of life or anything about the Russian people. And I would dearly love to know anything at all that would help in any way uh, to form some sort of peaceful relationship. Because all that we ever get in the media here is antagonistic towards the Russians. So if you could send us some message or anything at all, we'd be very happy with it. Susan. I'm Susan and I haven't really got much to say except I hope you got on well with your filming. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well that was uh that was a uh, smiley. Family. Uh, they live in a town called <coughs> Dumbarton, which is near Glasgow. Они живут в городе Dumbarton, недалеко от Glasgow. And in fact, their ho their home is uh, only a few kilometers from uh, an area where there are atomic submarines. Uh, their house is their home is about a thousand kilometers from here from your home uh, that's about the same distance as the distance from Leningrad to uh, the Caspian Sea or to Svedlovsk это приблизительно такое же расстояние как расстояние от Ленинграда, от вашего дома до Каспийского моря или до Свердловска. Really То есть вопрос заключается в том, как убрать это расстояние.